Hey guys, how's it hanging? Welcome to part 2 of a video where we take a closer look at the magic leap and the concept explored. In it, we try to break down some of the science and the components behind what's going to make this thing tick. Now, if you missed episode 1 where we looked at the photonic display and some of the lens properties, I'd say you should probably go back and watch that one first. But either way, let's get on with this one. So the main thing that I want to look at in this video is the eye tracking. I want to talk about what it is and why it's so important to the Magic Leap project, but also share some ideas on how they might go about doing it. And that part's kind of interesting. So if you've been following the AR scene, then chances are you know what eye tracking is. But just in case, it's a system of hardware and software that lets the computer know which part of the display the user is looking at. And it can be a useful thing to have for a few reasons. For one thing, it can let the wearer use their gaze just like a mouse to navigate and interact with the content displayed. Another big benefit that it can bring is to the graphical processing. So blah 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 and foveated rendering because we've all heard this like a hundred times now. If the computer knows which part of the display the user is looking at, it can just stick to rendering that part at a high detail and the rest of the display less so and it saves overtaxing the GPU. Now the last reason and maybe the most important is that it can let content developers do very subtle but very effective things in terms of interaction and immersion if they know which part of the display the user is looking at. But all in all, we can be almost guaranteed to see some form of eye tracking in the final Magic Leap. So how are they going to go about doing it? Well, we know they need at least two things. The first thing that you need is an image capturing device. Basically, that means a camera or something that can tell where the user's eyes are looking. The other thing that you need is an illumination system. Because what would happen if you were out somewhere bright and then you went indoors to a low light environment, the computer still needs to clearly be able to see where your pupils are focused. And that requires its own illumination system. Now if any of you guys are drivers and you've been pulled over while driving at night, then you'll know what I'm talking about when I say having a flashlight shone directly into your retina isn't the most comfortable sensation in the world. So we can be pretty sure that the Magic Leap won't be using a visible light source. Instead, what most AR headsets tend to use is infrared light. Now light in the infrared spectrum is perfect because the human eye can't detect it, but artificial sensors can, which means the eye can be fully illuminated without the user experiencing any discomfort. So all of these hardware requirements lead us to the first problem here. It can be cumbersome to arrange all this kit around the user's eyes, and all without occluding their view of their own surroundings. Now it's not so much of a big deal in virtual reality, where the user's view is already occluded, but it's difficult to find an acceptable way to do this in AR. And there's a big challenge here to try and find the most streamlined way to do it. So let's jump across to our first clip that looks at some of the challenges involved. Now it is difficult to make out every word that the speaker is saying, but I'm putting this clip in anyway because it's interesting and she just did a fantastic job of nailing all the points involved. So this is a talk from Dr. Hong Wa of University Arizona and what her team found when they tried to pair augmented reality with eye tracking technology. And the big challenge is a few, if none of them, are able to actually create a robust eye tracker HMD system that we can call that is truly portable, is lightweight, and it com conforms to a form factor that we would be able to use that for many daily activities. Okay, so those are the challenges involved. Now how about we jump across quickly to another clip so you can see them put to the test. Now this is a pair of AR glasses with eye tracking technology and this one is a collab between ODG and iFluence and I think this one is only like six months old at most so this is pretty much on the cutting edge of what's out there. Okay, I'll come over here. And this is a, by the way, this is now, this is going to be a first of a kind demo. So what I've mounted is a pair of ODG glasses. These are augmented reality glasses from Osterhout Design Group. They're equipped with our technology. I have them plugged into an external battery because we've, in this case, we've just wrapped, retrofit our technology on top of the glasses. And we've put eye tracking with eye interaction on the glasses. In my hand is the, both the battery and a dartboard. We're running some processing there, but we're running on low MIPS and low power. Okay, so here we go. So first of all, can you see my eyes? So right now, I'm moving my eyes around, 
Okay, and I'm gonna move counterclockwise. Okay, hands in my pocket, I'll keep my hands out. There's no clickers, there's no voice. So I'm just gonna move counterclockwise consistently one by one. The airplane, photo gallery, uh, health records, um, eye gaze, a grid, settings, uh, uh, gaze casting, a checklist, weather, uh, texts, and retail. So the first thing that you're gonna notice here is that this is not this. Now, we can't say too much because this thing wasn't built from the ground up. What we're looking at here is one product strapped to another. But it should be pretty clear that Dr. Wa wasn't kidding when she said there are some real challenges involved with the form factor. So let's go back to her video so we can see what her team came up with. And I believe that in order to solve that problem, actually in general for HMD, and to have a more elegant HMD design, we first need to, to have an optical approach that enables an HMD that we can create a very elegant form factor, could be as compelling as a pair of sunglasses. This actually recent years has been quite a hot topic in the HMD development community. In order to create a see-through display, first of all, you need to allow the outside light coming in and reach your eye, so that's the incoming light pass and the see-through pass. In this case, we have this free-form um, eyepiece prism and will be cemented with the free-form character and so allow the light enters the eye without noticeable distortion. Okay, so what are we looking at here? Well, we're talking about using photonics. We're talking about designing an optical element, a lens, that can display the computer-generated image without distorting the user's view of their own surroundings. And this diagram is showing us how it's being done. Over on the left-hand side of the diagram, you can see the first half of the lens. This is the waveguide lens. It's what the computer-generated image is shined into. And that could be coming from a Pico projector, or a scanning fiber tip, or in this case, a micro display. The red, green, and blue lines are showing us how the image is traveling through the lens. It's internally reflecting, and then exiting the face of the lens to enter the user's eye, enabling them to see the image. Over on the right-hand side of the diagram, we can see the second half of the lens. This is the correction lens. Basically, the first lens, the waveguide lens, it can bring in light from the computer display and present it to the user's eye in focus, but light entering it from most other angles is going to be distorted. So this correction lens is kind of like putting a pair of glasses on it. Any of you who had a close look at the Google Glass may recognize this setup because it had the same thing. Two prisms cemented together, one reflecting light from the computer display into the user's eye, the other admitting light from the user's own surroundings. And that enables the wearer to see both the augmented display and their own surroundings with both of them being in focus. That's the first photonic function of this lens. Basically, that's the AR job done. Okay, so what are the other functions, and how is the lens going to perform those? Well, we'll go back to Dr. Wah's video, but before we do, I need to give an extra, extra disclaimer that what you see next is no way guaranteed or even suggested to be a part of the final magic leap. We don't know what that's going to look like. For all we know, it could have the same form factor as the PSVR. We don't know, but the concepts that follow here these are scientifically possible. This is what science says is okay. So let's go. We want to introduce, use the same freeform element to, to collimate the light from multiple LEDs in order to illuminate the eye uniformly and creating the features we want to check. So that's the second function of the photonic element. She wants to use the same lens to illuminate the eye. And this diagram here, is showing us how that's being done. So the infrared light source is positioned outside of the wearer's field of view. It's injected into the lens and travels much the same way as the computer display, internally reflecting and then refracting out of the face of the lens to fully illuminate the user's eye. Okay, so now let's get this relevant to what we already know about the magic leap. Well, we all know the core principle behind their display. It's all about using a remote light source, projecting down the fiber optics and out through the waveguide. So how about infrared light? Well, some of you may know this, but the scanning fiber technique that the Magic Leap uses 
was developed by a team at University Washington headed up by Professor Eric Siebel. And if we pull up one of their old journal papers here, you can see that they actually did experiment with using AR display and scanning fibrous to project infrared light. It's all right here in the opening lines of the paper. Now, that was for a different purpose, but it still worked. So while speculation number one for this video, Magic Leap could use a similar technique for eye illumination purposes. We know that eye illumination is needed for eye tracking. We know that adding additional bulbs to the headset is clunky and bad for the form factor. And we know that they already have a remote light source. But wait a minute. Dr. Wah mentioned one other thing back in that video. Now, some of the eagle eye among you might have caught it, but let's go back and take a look. And the third function, once the eye is illuminated, we want to be able to use the same prism and be able to capture the eye image. Capture the eye image. Yep, she said that. She definitely, definitely said that. So now we're about to see a photonic solution to capturing an image. Then, based on that idea, so then we can place, for example, we can place LEDs on the side, on anywhere in this region, but we want to create this symmetrical pattern. So therefore, for example, LED placed over here, and it will follow the path and illumine the eye. And then the ray bundles on the top edge of the cone will be used for the eye image and it will be captured by an infrared sensor. So, no camera. Well, the glasses, the glass lens becomes the camera. Like a glass camera. This is the power of photonics. We now have image display, eye illumination, and image capture all being performed by one single element. It's like having a TV and a camera, but both of them made out of glass. It's crazy. Okay, so let's put all these pieces together. And to do that, we need to go back to the history of the Magic Leap scanning fiber technique. So here's Professor Siebel back in his university lab with his original invention. So looking at the core components behind the Magic Leap scanning fiber, this is what Professor Siebel and his team originally developed it for. It was originally built to be an endoscope, an imaging device, and retrofitted into a display after the fact. So Magic Leap may actually be able to use a similar eye tracking technique to the one demonstrated by Dr. Wa. So what would that look like? Well, you'd have the understood setup with the individual fibers carrying in the visible light for the display through the red green and blue lasers, but then you'd have an additional set of fiber optic cables to carry in the infrared light for the eye illumination system. Lastly, you'd have an additional set of fibers to bring back the live captured eye image to complete the eye tracking. So a three-step function similar to Dr. Wah's method where display, eye illumination and image capture are all being performed through a single display element. Beyond Dr. Wah's lab experiments, there are actual real-world examples of this technique being used before, but mostly in military or non-commercial applications, and usually with a price tag ranging in the $80,000 range. But I think that's the most important thing that we're seeing with the Magic Leap project, because if you take Dr. Wah's method developed in University of Arizona, or Zebra Imaging's photonic display methods that we saw in the last episode, or even Professor Siebel's scanning fiber technique that he developed at University of Washington. So many of them have similar origins, normally coming from the academic field, normally coming from higher education. But for years now, just because you developed an incredible breakthrough somewhere, there's no guarantee that what you've created is going to make it through to the real world applications. And if you don't believe me, then go and Google Starlight Material. But I think we're seeing a real change there. Because in years past, just like how you saw Zebra Imaging start off by trying to sell displays or Siebel's method where they were trying to gear it towards a medical device, if you couldn't get into one of those big industries, there was no guarantee that your discovery or breakthrough was going to see the light of day. And just because you had created something incredible, 
it didn't instantly make you like a great businessman. There was no guarantee that you'd be able to convey how important your discovery was to commercial investors. But I think we're seeing a modern change in the 21st century. I think we're seeing big companies with deep coffers like Google or Alibaba or whosoever. They're actually actively going out and seeking some of these breakthroughs and looking for the best way that they can bring them together to create incredible products. And I think the Magic Leap is going to be the first child of that kind of way of thinking. Because more than just seeking out these breakthroughs, they're willing to invest in them and give them an environment where they can actually be developed into commercial applications. And when that happens, we all become winners. In times gone by, most of the major breakthroughs in technology that we'd see, they'd come out of coveted institutions like Bell Labs, or they would have been developed for the military or aeronautical industry, and they'd trickled down into consumer products after the fact. But I think we're starting to see a paradigm shift here, where obscure but important breakthroughs are being made in academic fields and they're being seriously funded and seriously put forwards into real world applications. And I think that whole way of thinking goes a long way towards explaining the major funding that we've seen Magic Leap receive so far. But all in all, these are things that we will learn more about when the product finally launches. Anyway, you definitely want to check out the next episode where we look at an interesting concept called glass bandwidth and that's basically to do with where some of these image capturing possibilities are leading us. Alright guys, that about wrapped it up for this episode. If there's anything that I missed or something that you wanted to ask, drop a comment below or head over to the dedicated sub on Reddit. I'll leave a link in the description. Other than that, I'm out.